Section 15.7, Le Chatelier's Principle. This is one of my favorite sections in the book, and most students love Le Chatelier's Principle. Ain't nobody don't like Le Chatelier's Principle, and most everybody gets it. So I hope you're one of the people that get it, and not the few that don't get it. Um, but let me try to explain it. Let me read it first. Uh, this is a simplified, I'm sure it was harder in French when he wrote this, but uh, simplified idea. But then I'm going to give you even a simpler kind of picture. Hope hope it helps. It. If a system at equilibrium is disturbed by a change in temperature, pressure, or the concentration of one of the components, the system will shift its equilibrium position so as to counteract the effect of the disturbance. Okay? So let me... Before I even try to explain this, let me give you a picture. Let's say that there is, we're at the lake or in the ocean or something like this. So this is water, okay? And there's a wave. So that some of this water is all humped up here and some is dipped. And the, wa the water level is here, okay? So this is higher, this is lower, and there's a dip here. Well, what's going to happen if you have a dip in the water? The gravity is going to push this water over, and you're going to have a wave. Okay, so the, the, this water is going to go from high, humped up, to filling this hole. Okay, it's going to move its position in order to change its stability or change its equilibrium. Because its equilibrium is, is seeking out a level. That water is seeking out a level. So let's say I have a, a hump of water to the left and a dip of water to the right, the water is going to naturally go from left to right to fill in the hole so that it will re reach a level of equilibrium. Now what's going to happen eventually is that you're going to end up with a new level of equilibrium. So let's say that I have the bathtub with some water in it, and I pour a bucket of water into the bathtub. So here's water being poured into the bathtub from my bucket. Here's my bucket. Okay. Water's being poured in. Here is where the level was normally. Okay, this is where the level was before I started pouring water in it. And I start humping up the water, and it starts filling in the holes. And what'll happen is that this layer, this level goes down. This is going to drop, but the normal level is going to go up a little bit because I have added water to it. So it's not going to be its old level. It's going to seek a new level based on the new amount of water that I have. Okay. Likewise, if I have a hump of water on the left or on the right and a dip of, of water on the left, it doesn't care which way it's going to go. It's going to move to fill in the hole. By the way, this is how the wind blows. You're going to have concentrated air, which is basically tight-fitting air molecules, and then around it is going to be looser molecules. So you're going to have high pressure here low pressure here, and that wind always blows from high pressure to low pressure all the time. Every single time that the wind blows, it's going to blow from where the air is bunched up to where the air is not bunched up. It's going to fill the hole. Okay, This air moving or this water moving is exactly the same idea that Le Chatelier had in terms of once that the equilibrium has been um, reached, so something is in equilibrium, if I disturb it somehow by either adding or taking away uh, components, either products or reactants, once it's all balanced and I take away something, I've made a hole. Okay, so if I take away something on the left, what's going to happen? The whole equilibrium system is going to shift to the left to fill in that hole. Now, the level is going to be lower than it once was, but it doesn't matter. It's going to reach an equ a new equilibrium system, okay? If I have, um, if I add some stuff to the left, well, that that is now going to make it shift to the right. Now, remember, right is more products, okay? There's more products to the right. There's more reactants to the left. So if I am adding stuff on the on the left, it's going to move towards the right, to lessen the effect of that disturbance. That's what's going to happen. So if I, if I add some products, it's going to shift it to the left. If I take away some reactants, it's going to shift it to the left. Do you see it? If I add some products or add some reactants 
and I it'll shift to the right. If I take away some products, it's going to shift to the right. Now this is going to happen for concentration. Okay, it's going to happen in uh, in terms of concentration. Um, it's going to happen in terms of of temperature. So we can see that heat is actually at, uh, acting like a product or a reactant, and it's also going to talk about volume, which essentially is changing the pressure. So these the same idea is going to be used in different ways, and hopefully it'll make some sense to you. I think a lot of a lot of kids like this. All right, so here's our example we're going to use. We're going to have this is the Haber process. This is nitrogen plus hydrogen gas yields ammonia, uh, and it's K sub C. Uh, that's its equilibrium constant is 0.291, whatever, at a certain temperature. Okay, so I'm going to have nitrogen gas, triple bond nitrogen, three hydrogen molecules yielding two moles of ammonia. All right, all three are gases, by the way. All right, so let's do one thing. Let's add some nitrogen. Okay, so let me show you here, and then I'll put it back to my, to my um, scribbling. If I add some nitrogen, I've basically humped up on the left. I've, I've made a reactant. Remember, N plus H yields ammonia. So this is a reactant. I've added a reactant, so I've, I've piled up on the, on the reactant side. So what's going to happen? It's going to move to the right in order to, to uh, counteract that disturbance. So what will happen is I add it here, and it's going to start dropping immediately. Why is it dropping? Well, I've got nitrogen plus hydrogen yielding ammonia. Ammonia is on the right, nitrogen is on the left. So it's gonna it's dropping because it's making more ammonia. Well, if if nitrogen drops, hydrogen also has to drop because it's being used up to make more ammonia. So we see in hydrogen, hydrogen is also dropping. Hydrogen was there. I added some nitrogen, and the second that I added to the nitrogen, the nitrogen and started reacting with some of that hydrogen to make more ammonia. Well, what happens to the ammonia? The ammonia starts growing because I'm being more ammonia is being made. So do you see, by adding something to the left, I shift it to the right. Okay, so here, here I can go in both directions. I think this slide, any of the changes marked in blue, shifts it to the left. Anything marked in red will shift it to the right, okay? So what's going to happen? Let's do the blue first. Decrease means I've made a hole. If I made a hole, then it's going to go to the left in order to fill the hole. Does that make sense? So if I have less, uh, less nitrogen, the whole equilibrium is going to shift to the left to fill that hole. And so more ammonia is going to go away and break apart into hydrogen and nitrogen. Okay. Same thing with uh, if I decrease the hydrogen. If I decrease the hydrogen, I've made a hole. That means that the ammonia is used up in order to fill that hole. What if I increase it? If I increase nitrogen, I've made a hump. Okay, And so this is going to shift to the right to get rid of some of that nitrogen, meaning that more ammonia is going to be made. What if I do the same thing to the hydrogen? Hydrogen, I've made a hump because I've increased it. If I've increased it, then it's going to go away to, to relieve some of the stress that it's added by that by increasing it, and so more ammonia is going to be made. All right. What if I decrease ammonia? If I decrease ammonia, I've made a I've made a dip. That means more nitrogen and hydrogen are going to be used up in order to make more to fill that hole in. Okay, so it's going to move to the right. What if I increase it and make a hump? Well, then it's going to move to the left to alleviate that stress. So wherever the pile is, it's going to go the other way. Wherever the dip is, it's going to go that way. Okay? So if you're standing in a hole, it's going to fill in towards you. If you're standing on a hill, it's going to go away from you. That's essentially concentration. Now, you once you learn concentration, you really have learned them all because the same idea is affected by all of these. So this is a harder one. Uh, I probably would have done this last, but I should have done this last. This is a little bit harder to see. Let's say I reduce the volume of something, okay? If I reduce the volume of something, I have increased the pressure, okay? Do you remember PV equals NRT? So if, if, P, goes, if P goes up as V goes down, so, so PV is on the same side of the equal sign, 
So if I decrease, okay, I, I move something in, I increase the volume, or de decrease the volume, I've increased the pressure, okay? If I've increased the pressure, it's no longer at equilibrium, okay? What I've done is I've changed the Q now that it's not at equilibrium anymore. I've changed Q without changing K, and so now something is going to have to happen to alleviate that stress. And what's going to happen with volume has to do with how big the molecules are. They want to readjust themselves to be the smallest that they can be so that they're all nice and happy. Okay, they're going to break apart into, into happy. Okay, so what's going to happen, whichever, if you're going to make something smaller and increase the, the, the pressure, the way you alleviate the stress is to change into the smaller number of molecules. Okay, so let's say, let's say I, again I have nitrogen gas plus hydrogen gas yields, um, it was three, right? It was one hydrogen, three, or one nitrogen, three hydrogen, two ammonia. Okay, well how many moles of gas are on the right? I've got two moles of gas on the right. How many on the left? Four moles of gas on the on the left. So if I decrease the volume, if I decrease the volume, I've increased the pressure. Do you see that if I can make this from four moles down to two moles, it crowds better. The lower number of moles crowds into that space better than the bigger number of moles. So when it comes to volume and pressure, what you're going to do is if you increase the pressure by decreasing the volume, you're going to shift towards the lower number of moles, in this case, the right. If you increase the volume size, which decreases the volume, I'm sorry, decreases the pressure, then you're making more space. If you make more space, the, it's going to want to fill in that space, and the easier way to fill in that space is to move towards the, the number of moles that are larger. Okay, so this is a little bit different than the, than the dip in the hole, but it's the same concept behind it you will shift towards the side that either fills in the space or is easier to crowd into the smaller space. Okay, temperature. I, if you think of heat as a reactant or a product, you already know how to do this. Just think of something, if it's exothermic, that means heat is being released. Think of, think of it as being um, on the right. So remember, exothermic has a negative kilojoules, okay, and the uh, entropy is a negative, so that means I consider this, however much this is negative, it's losing it, I'm thinking of it as a product, so I'm going to put it on the right, okay, if I have an endothermic reaction, which has an, a positive um, enthalpy, then I'm going to have it as one of the reactants, okay, because I needed to put it in in order to make those new bonds, so that's what endothermic means, so I'm going to put it as one of the reactants. Well, now it's just a hump and a dip, okay? If I add heat, what's going to happen? It's a reactant. It's going to shift it away. So if I add heat, it's going to shift it away to alleviate that stress. If I remove heat, if it's on the left, it's endothermic, and I remove heat, then, then the re reactants are going to get more. The products are going to be used up to make more reactants to alleviate that stress. Okay, exactly the same way on the other side. If it's a product, exothermic is a product, and I remove it, then I made a dip, and then it's going to move towards the right to fill in the hole. If I if I increase it, then I made a hump, and it's going and the stress is going to go away and make more more reactants. I hope this is making sense. Lots of people like this. I like this a lot. The last section is the effect of catalyst. And if you remember a catalyst is something that is not used up in the reaction. It's necessary for the reaction, but it's not one of the reactants. It's something maybe the reactants will attach to or something that make it easier for something to happen. So what will happen if you remember reactants, you're going to have a, a certain um, energy level, and then the products would have, in this case, lower. So this is an exothermic reaction. Energy is going to be released. Well, to go from here to here there may be an activation energy, okay, depending on what it is, depending on what, which, uh, 
what type of reaction it is, you're going to have to have some energy to make it happen. Remember, that's why we have uh, Bunsen burners on the lab station. If you bump the ener bu give it enough energy to bump it together, you might end up with a chemical reaction a lot faster than if you just let it sit on, on the table. So a catalyst reduces, makes it easier for the chemical reaction to happen. Okay, that's what your body does. All the enzymes, all the, all the enzymes in your body are catalysts to make the reactions in your body happen faster at low temperature. You don't have to burn something at 2,000 degrees. You can burn it at 98 Fahrenheit and still have it fine as long as you have these catalysts that are reducing the reaction. Well, here's the, here's the situation with catalysts. If I reduce the reaction, the energy of reaction, the action, activation energy, I'm, re, I'm reducing it depending on which way I'm going. To go from right to left, I've reduced it. Okay. To go from left to right, I've also reduced it. Well, if I've reduced the energy going right and reduced the energy going left, then it doesn't matter if I had a catalyst. It's not going to shift anything because I haven't made a hole on one side and a hump on the other. I've made holes on both sides or humps on both sides, and since I have, it doesn't change the equilibrium. It's still both equal. The only time that you're going to get a river moving is when one side of the river is high and the other side is low. If they're all the same, if it's always equal, meaning no matter how high it is, a boat will float without moving. It's just going to sit there. So when you add a catalyst, nothing happens. So, so if you change concentration, it's going to shift. If you change pressure, it's going to shift. If you change temperature, it's going to shift. If you add a catalyst, nothing happens. I hope this helps you.